Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Shackman. Remember just 10 years ago when people talked about us living in a post-racial society? Not only did that not happen, but we moved even further from that dream. If anything, the moral arc of racial justice has moved in the wrong direction. The socio-political reasons are many. It's as if the perfect storm of political, social, technological, and economic change converged to create a powerful machine to drive deep wedges between every group in society. But while the causes are many, complex, global, and systemic, it just might be that the solutions are personal, human, and individual. We can be, at least with respect to racism, the masters of our own fate. We're going to talk about this today with my guest, Paul Kibble. He's an award-winning author and an accomplished trainer and speaker. He's been a social justice activist, a nationally and internationally recognized anti-racism educator, and an innovative leader in violence prevention for over 40 years. It is my pleasure to welcome Paul Kibble here to talk about his book, Uprooting Racism, How White People Can Work for Racial Justice. Paul Kibble, welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you. It's great to be with you this morning. Is there a fundamental difference? Can we look at systemic racism and personal and individual racism in different ways and approach them differently? I think that they're all very much interconnected, but it it does help to take them apart and think about our individual lives and relationships and um, actions and in the context of the institutionalized and cultural uh, levels that racism operates on every day. Mm -hmm. To what extent do we see more ups and downs and more more of an arc in terms of the systemic and societal and cultural racism as opposed to individual racism? I think that Systemic racism is part of the foundations of our country, um, and part of the problem is we've never acknowledged how much our culture, our society, our economic well-being is based on the exploitation of the land that we stole from Native Americans and on the uh, the periods of slavery and uh, Jim Crow and, and extended periods of exploitation of the labor of people of color, including today in terms of domestic work and farm work and um, all kinds of things. So um, it's, it's been consistent and, and we, don't, we can't really get at the roots of it and, until we acknowledge that history and how it currently impacts our lives. Um, So what happens, though, is that at certain periods it becomes very dramatic because there's, well, right now we have an administration that is manifesting a lot of very specifically racist policies and and rhetoric. And, um, you know, uh, different times, different things come up that bring it to our attention, often because people of color are out in the streets protesting, like it's Standing Rock or Black Lives Matter, and we, it becomes unavoidable for those of us who are white. But it's, it, it, the, the foundation is, is steady, and we need to really dig deeper at the roots so that we actually begin to build a society that I, I think we all want to live in. There's been often talk that generational change will make a difference. Generational change hasn't really made a difference historically. Talk a little bit about that as it relates to this idea you're discussing of getting at the roots of it. Generational change could make a difference, but the problem is that we keep indoctrinating uh, new generations of white youth into the ra- accepting racism as it is. Um, our textbooks are still woefully inadequate in uh, documenting the true history of this country. Um, the everyday culture, the media, the video games, the cartoons, the advertisements, uh, things like that um, reinforce racist stereotypes and the status quo. Um, and many of us in our families are reluctant to even talk about racism with our young people. So one of the things as as parents, as teachers, as youth workers that we need to do is actually help young people navigate this system so that they can, in fact, bring a different perspective um, and be working to change things. What about the extent to which racism has become as politicized as it is today? I think that one of the things that happened uh, after the Civil Rights Movement, there was a tremendous backlash, and uh, white people started 
feeling like they were under attack and that it was a post-racial society, that people of color were okay after that. Um, and then with Obama being president, it really reinforced for many white people that, you know, we're over that. We did that. We, we fixed it. Um, and, and that's obviously not the case, but there's still tremendous denial and minimization among white people about the extent of racism. Uh, a recent poll showed that the majority of white respondents thought racism wasn't a major problem in this country, and a majority thought that it wasn't happening in their community. And so one of the things we do is we say it's someplace else. It's over there. I grew up in California thinking racism was a problem in the South, and it took me years to, to really see how extensive and pervasive it is here in California. So we need to admit that it is happening pervasively. It has devastating impacts on people of color. It also has devastating impacts on the white community. And it's constantly being reinforced by the fact that we have tremendous economic inequality. And those at the top of the economic pyramid um, are, are regularly directing our attention away from them as decision makers uh, towards communities of color like recent immigrants, uh, uh, the African-American community, uh, Muslims, any number of groups that were directed to blame for our problems, whereas the real culprits are the folks at the top of the pyramid making the decisions that move jobs overseas and uh, exploit the land and uh, produce toxic waste in our food and water and things like that. Mm -hmm. Can the issue of race and racism be separated out from all of those other issues that you're talking about? Uh, only abstractly, theoretically. Um, racism is, in, is part of the fabric of our society. So it's, it's in the school system, it's in the health care system, the criminal legal system. Uh, it impacts the job and housing markets. Uh, and what we see on the media so we need to develop, as white people, a, a racial lens. Uh, this is something that people of color have to do just for their own survival. They, they have to analyze how racism is playing out in particular situations because they never know when, when it's going to pop up and when they're going to be under attack. Uh, because white people, uh, we live in such segregated communities. Our housing, jobs, religious institutions, and schools are highly segregated today, even as much so as they were in the 50s before Brown versus Board of Education. So um, we don't have the information, we don't have the, the lens to understand and see racism as it's happening. And we need to develop that lens and assume that racism is extensive and pervasive. And that when we get better at noticing it, seeing how it works, then we can interrupt it. Then we can step in and work to change things. Talk about the impact of diversity, because at one point it was black-white racism that we were talking about. Now it's so much more widespread. Well, it's not just it's not that racism is so much more widespread, but um, you know, the, um, African Americans have always played a, a critical role in our society, and if been the uh, generators of tremendous amount of the, the labor and creativity of our culture and, and, and just our, our economy. At the same time, uh, Native Americans are um, also an intricate part of the economy and the culture and have been um, severely exploited. Um, uh, Latinx and Asian Americans and others have also been always part of the fabric of our society, always marginalized, uh, deemed dangerous, and, uh, and excluded from being citizens and having the vote and all kinds of basic things that as white people we take for granted. So I think it's important that these days it is much harder just to have a black-white conversation because uh, racism is complex and different groups are impacted differently. You've been looking at this issue for a long time. I mentioned in the introduction that this is the fourth edition of the book. Talk a little bit about what's changed in your mind in terms of how you approach talking to people about the subject of racism. 
I think there's a uh, few things that are different. Um, one is that we have a new generation of young leadership of people of color. Uh, we've seen this at Standing Rock and at, in the Black Lives Matter movement, the DACA youth, the uh, fight against Islamophobia and the Muslim ban. Um, and they have been bringing to our national attention in, in in disputable in disputable ways just how severe uh racism is in their lives and in our entire community so um i've part of my work in an upper, my book uprooting racism is to highlight those voices and to follow their lead in terms of addressing what we need to face today um i think at the same time because of the current administration and the neo the rise of neo nazi groups in, in our streets um and a variety of other things that there's more and more white people who are uh upset confused angry frustrated um wanting to do something and so i really wanted to provide uh toolbox for white people, ways to get involved, uh, stories, uh, history, uh, guidelines, activities, questions, lots of different resources so that people, white people in particular, can break the silence in white communities and step up as allies to people of color in working to not only work for racial justice, but for economic and gender justice as well. Is it something that, that white people can truly understand? Can they truly grasp the the depths of it, the history of it, the roots, as you talked about at the outset? Well, I don't know about truly understand because we don't experience it, but we, we can certainly get to a point where we have enough knowledge and information and insight and compassion to be able to uh, identify how racism is working around us in our schools and neighborhoods and workplaces and to get involved in doing something about it. I think part of the problem is, uh, as white people, we often want to be perfect. We want to have the answer. We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want to hurt anybody. All all good intentions, but they get in the way of us actually doing anything. Um, I had to come to grips with that in writing the book. Um, it's a book I wanted to be out there to be able to give to people but I thought that, well, I wouldn't do it perfectly. I would make mistakes. People would be angry at me. I didn't know enough. I, I had all kinds of reasons why I, I, it wasn't for me to write it. So I was, I was waiting around for somebody else to write it who would do it better. And then I realized that, that those are many of the reasons that we give as white people for not getting involved. Um, and we have to break through that with a real commitment to uh, using our compassion and our courage to step in and get involved and, and make a difference. How much more difficult is it now, given the, the tenor that comes from Washington and the, the almost institutionalization of racism on a certain level? It, it, I think it, it's um, more difficult in the sense that there's um, it gives permission for people to be more racially explicit and public. At the same time, it is so explicit in public and in our face that um, it's easier to talk about because so many white people are upset about what's going on in one way or another because they are part of groups that are targeted by this administration. So I, I find that um, actually it's a relief for folks to have an opportunity to talk about these issues. And, but one of the problems is in the white community is that we're very reluctant to talk about racism explicitly. We often talk about it with other white people in, in kind of coded language, but in terms of actually bringing it up in our families with our kids or in our classrooms or in our workplaces, uh, it's that silence that is a complicity with the status quo, and our passivity is a, a form of collusion. So it's really important that we take that step to, to bring up racism, to identify it, to notice it, um, to have those conversations with those around us, friends and family, or co-workers, uh, things like that, so that we can, in fact, um, get a, a public conversation going in, in a more productive way. And how does it begin? What are the personal beginning steps that you talk about? It starts with um, first doing a little bit of education ourselves so we're more aware of what's going on. Um, and it starts with 
just asking some questions about with the people around us. How are you feeling about what's happening? Well, about the statements from the White House and the policies. The how do you feel about the attacks on immigrants and the Muslim ban? Um, I'm and and it's about sharing our own feelings and experience. You know, I'm really upset about this. Um, how do you feel about it, or what do you think? And. Um, I'd really like to try to do something and, um, you know, maybe we can do something together. It's, it's about inviting people into the conversation, um, expecting them to be curious and interested and perhaps misinformed, but of, of good uh, will and uh, good intent. How should individuals deal with pushback to that when, the, when, when groups push back to that very idea with with the notion that well you just don't understand you can't understand etc i think a couple things that are important to keep in mind when you get pushed back one um you know there's a certain percentage of the population of, of white folks in this country who are just staunchly racist and are not going to be moved by uh conversation and it's not very useful to spend a lot of time trying to get in to convince them or to get into arguments and fights about that. Um, we need to be, but there are at the same time millions of white people who are concerned and would like to, things to be different and better. And those are the folks we need to engage. Um, so it's um, it's important that we you know, kind of sort out who who is it useful for us to have be having these conversations with. And that may not be everybody around us. Uh, the other thing is that when there are racist comments or racist practices in our workplace or <clears throat> in our public institutions, then we need to step up and not have a conversation so much as interrupt that, is to say, wait a second, this is not fair, this is not just um, what you said is hurtful, is... Uh, uh, et cetera, um, and to really um, challenge the status quo, the collusion that so often as white people we participate in. And often we'll find that other white people are sitting around waiting for somebody to say something and, uh, and, and are uncomfortable but aren't willing to take that uh, initial step. But our behavior really role models for other white people what it's like to step up and stand for uh, equity and justice. Uh, it, it, it's a role model for the young people in our lives, but it's also a role model for the other adults. Um, it gives them a sense that, oh, yeah, I could do that, or, yeah, that's a, I could say that or be part of that. Is there a unique role for educational institutions in all this? Uh, absolutely. Uh, educational institutions have a key role. Um, and by educational institutions, I think about that pretty widely because our families are educational institutions and our religious organizations are also educational institutions for our young people. Um, part of the way that racism is perpetrated and, and perpetuated is through the training of each new generation of young white people to believe that this is the way it is, that there's a natural racial hierarchy, that white people are superior and we've done everything of importance in the world, and to know very little about people of color and their contributions to our society. So we need to be looking at the curricula, we need to be looking at the hiring of teachers, we need to be looking at more subtle things like who gets promoted into um, AP classes and who gets discipline more harshly, um, because all of these are areas that have racial impact and have um, racial um, facets to them. I think that we have to realize that this is a long-term struggle, um, that we need to be working now. There, there's no time to wait, but that we're, we need to bring more and more people into this struggle. But I think what we need to be working for is to make it so that, that that's unnecessary. Paul Kivel, his book is Uprooting Racism, How White People Can Work for Racial Justice. Paul, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on Radio Who, What, Why. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening and joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org 
forward slash donate.